I got an email not too long ago, uh, I, and I'm just going to say up front, I don't know if this story is true. I don't know the writer. I don't know anything about it. But it's written so well that I'm not going to read it like I normally do the emails that I get. I'm going to kind of read this like an audio book. It's quite long, but it is an unbelievable story. It's a Bigfoot story. I think it's Bigfoot. We'll just have to see, but it's just going to blow you away. So let's jump into it. The writer titles the story, My Brother's Keeper. I didn't know how to write this story because I'm not a writer and I never claimed to be, but I thought this ought to be told. I'm going to say what has been happening. I didn't know a much better way to start than from when I first had the idea to write this down. I had planned on keeping all of this to myself, but I was talked out of that. This is what happened and this is what we're doing now. It's important for you to know that I had permission to tell this and was given the freedom to tell it in the way that I thought was best. Saturday afternoons used to be for watching old westerns on the television, but for the last while they've been spent at the library downtown. I didn't much like doing it, but when I remembered why I was down there, it made me feel kind of small for complaining. So I took a deep breath and I did what I was supposed to be doing. I started going down there on Saturday afternoons because I was a lot less likely to run into anyone I knew. People I knew were all the time trying to be good intentioned, but their questions and inquiries were still hard to answer. No one outside our small family knew the whole truth, and I wanted to keep it that way if I could. Not even the badges knew everything. We've been through enough without more being added to the pile, and that's what would happen if word got around. I couldn't let her go through that. Life was hard enough as it is without all that other. Life is going to be hard enough for her from now on without more being added on. And it's my job to protect her. It says so in the rule book they give you when your first daughter is born. I failed once like you wouldn't believe. I will not fail her again. The nice lady that runs the library bends the rules for me because of the special circumstances, and I'm grateful to her for that kindness. The limit on checking books out to read is three at a time, but she looks the other way and allows me to walk out with five each time. Today, it's books six through ten in the series about that wonderful wizard over in Oz. Most folks don't know that there's more than one book. I sure didn't know that, but my daughter did, and she's been on a kick to read them all lately. So I returned one through five, and I picked up these today. I think there were two or three after these. I guess you'll let me know by next Saturday afternoon. Lizzie turned 15 two months ago. Her name is really Melissa, but we call her Lizzie. I don't know why, it's just something either her mother or I started doing and we never stopped. Lissy didn't used to be such a reader, but she didn't used to be a lot of things. She spends most of her time now reading. And I'd give everything I have and am ever going to have if things could go back to the way they used to be. But that isn't going to happen. So I go to the library when she asks me to. It's the very least I can do. She's not the only one I wish I could do more for. Sometimes you do what you can and hope that it's enough for a few minutes. It's never enough, but it's what you can do at the time. I was in that no man's land between the quiet security of the book-filled library and the safety of the bench seat of my pickup truck when the dreaded happened. James Lee Amos saw me and started hollering my name just as if every dang person in the world had been waiting to stop what they were doing so they could see me give Jill my attention. Everyone called James Lee J.L. Those of us that knew him best shortened it, and now we just call him Jill. 
I nodded and motioned with my armful of books that I needed to keep to the task at hand, but Jill is hard to stop once he starts moving. I knew that he was going to follow me all the way to my truck and that conversation would only begin there. Jill's a good guy, maybe the best one I know, but I wanted to be heading home and I was running through the tales I could pawn off on him that would get me out of there without hurting his feelings. None thus far had seemed feasible and he was gaining ground. Just close your eyes and think of England, I told myself. He'll let you off the hook soon enough. This too shall pass, I reminded myself. I wondered if I could get my keys out of my pocket and get in the truck and start it before he reached me. If the engine was running, then proper social etiquette dictates that any conversation be abbreviated. But I dropped the keys under my truck door and had to put the books on the hood so I could get down on my knees to get them. That was when he made up the ground and arrived before I was standing again. He didn't help me up, though. He was too busy reading the spines of the books. I didn't blame him for not offering me a hand up. I wouldn't have offered him one either. Guys have rules about those types of things, especially when you're out in public. Grins come too seldom anymore. So when you see someone the age of Jill and me trying to get up off the pavement, especially if that person has started building a shed over his belt buckle, well, you stand back and you watch the scramble. Jill finished looking at the books about the time I made it back upright. Are these books for Lizzie? I can't imagine them being your taste, he said. Yeah, she likes that type of story, I said. She calls Betty inside there and talks about books all the time. I come down here and get whatever they have decided on for her to read that week. I told him this as I unlocked my door. Well, how's Lizzie doing? Well, we should have come by a couple of times to see her or ask if any of you all needed anything. But Jen and I both figured privacy might be what you all were needing. Well, I appreciate that, Jill. I appreciate you thinking that way rough. Some days are better than others, but I'm afraid it's always going to be hard. Give it some time and I'm sure Lissy would love to see you and Jen one day soon. Jill nodded his head and I was beginning to think that I just might be able to make my getaway in record time, but then he took a look over my shoulder and all my hopes disappeared. Holy cow, have you started truck farming? He asked me. I was afraid he would see what was back there, and sure enough, he did. You can always count on Jill to show up when you don't want him to and to stick his nose in where you rather he didn't. He's not intrusive or pesky. He just believes that if you are his friend, then everything you have going on is his business too, both the good stuff and the bad. There are times when you might rather him be somewhere else, but when times are tough, there isn't a better man in this world to have standing by your side. If you go down, Jill will go down with you, and he'll go down swinging. I hated lying to Jill like I hate poison, but I was going to have to lie. Becky got herself hooked on one of those Food Network shows, the one where they tell you how you can preserve everything from beets to kudzu. She has me going over to Robbie's produce stand every Saturday and getting whatever's in season so she can preserve it for the coming ice age or the apocalypse. It makes her happy and there's been too little of that in recent days, so if she wants to fill the garage shelves with mason jars full of green beans, then I'll go get them for her and never say a word. That's what I told him. Your good husband, he told me. I told him that I probably wasn't, but I was always trying to be. No, you're a good husband and a good father, but you're the sorriest excuse for a liar I've ever known. I knew Becky before you did. I knew her in school, and she was in home ec class that they made me take. Thirty plimpy idiots in there, and Becky was the only one who could burn water. The dang landfill is full of takeaway food containers and almost every one of them came from your house. Becky has the cleanest, most unused oven in this town. 
If you're going to lie to me, at least make it a lie I might believe. Well, I'm insulted you put so little thought into that one, he said. Jill had me dead to rights, and I didn't know what to say to him. There were four or five bushels of produce in the bed of my truck, and Jill's mind was working as fast to figure out why as mine was at trying to keep the truth from him. I'm going to split so you can get those books home to Lissy, he said. You give her a great big hug for me and call me when you have more believable lies to feed me. I was a little embarrassed about how things had just gone. In a very nice Jill-type way, I had just been knocked down a couple of pegs. It had been his way of telling me that he was a little bruised by my not thinking I could trust him with whatever I was keeping to myself. I knew I shouldn't have gone to Robbie's for the produce before going into town. I knew it would raise eyebrows. But Robbie had called and said he needed to close early, so I had to rearrange things. And like clockwork, Jill had been where I didn't want him to be. I wanted to say something, and I needed to say something, if only to make Jill feel okay. But I didn't know what I could tell him. I tossed the books on the seat, and I sat down behind the steering wheel. I watched as he walked across the street and waved to someone going into the Rexall drugstore. He never looked back in my direction. I drove home with the sound turned down on the radio. I wanted to hear only my thoughts for a while. Becky came out into the yard to collect the books while I was breaking down the empty cardboard boxes that had been full of vegetables only a short while before. After she asked, I told her that everything had gone fine aside from running into Jill. I told her how I'd tried lying to him and how I'd been caught in it. She told me that I should feel glad instead of bad. That little uncomfortable episode in town was a clear reminder to me of two things that I should always be proud of. I should always remember that I'm a lousy liar because I almost always tell the truth about almost everything. Maybe not the whole truth, but enough of it. And I should be proud that I have my best friend that knows me well enough to know that I'm greasing him. And I suppose she was right, but it didn't make me feel any better. Becky told me that she would make a pot of coffee for us, and it'd be ready by the time I had finished. She wasn't any better at making coffee than she was at cooking, but I had grown used to her brew. Lissy had her head buried in one of her new books, so Becky brought the cups and the pot out onto the small back porch where I was sitting. We like sitting and talking out there. We always have. Becky was real popular back in school from everything that I've heard. She is three years younger than I am, so I didn't know her very well during those years. She's told me many times that fellas always wanted to date her because of the way she filled out her sweaters and her jeans. But I was the only one who liked being with her because of the way that we could talk so easily with each other. Now, she can still fill out those sweaters and jeans. They're just a few sizes larger now than they were then. But I would still rather sit and talk with her more than anyone else I've ever known. I stretched out one of my legs and scooted her chair back from the table for her. I used to be able to stick a toe of my shoe under a chair and pull her back up to the table too, but she has it anchored down a little better now when she sits down. If you don't call Jill and say something, you're just going to keep feeling badly, she said to me. Well, she was right, but I hadn't even had my first swallow yet. She had already thrown the advice right down on the table. Becky isn't one for beating around the bushes. Yeah, I was thinking about giving him a jingle and offering some sort of apology. It's what I ought to do, but... Then he would want to know why I had lied at all, and that would just be a whole other thing, I told her. Why don't you tell him the truth, she said. Well, I nearly spit a mouthful of coffee out when she said that. I've worked very hard at keeping a few things undiscovered, and she knows that. She couldn't have said anything that would have surprised me more. You're doing the best that you can, better than I can imagine anyone else doing, but I think you need a little help. 
Now, Jill is your best friend, and there isn't anything he wouldn't try to do if you ask him. And given his job, he's probably exactly what you need, she said. Well, I didn't say anything as I thought about her words. Looking at her always made me wonder what my role in our partnership really was. She was supposed to be the good-looking one, but apparently she was the smart one, too. There's a movie marathon on cable tonight about one of those small towns that is filled with attractive teenage vampires. Absolutely just the type of thing that Lizzie can't wait to watch, but that I would hate. Why don't you go give Jill a call and invite him out for a burger so we can have a talk with him? Lizzie and I'll stay here and rank all the handsome vampires. I think it's what you need to do, she said. There is no going back if I tell him, I told her. Our life now is just one never-ending can't go back. Now call him and ask for his help. It'll be good for you and it'll mean the world to him once he understands everything, she said. I didn't say anything. I just kept my forehead pressed against hers after I had risen from the table. I felt her fingers on the back of my neck as she pulled my forehead tighter to hers. I hung up the wall-mounted phone soon after Jill had agreed to me picking him up in a couple of hours. I had been the one to suggest grabbing a burger and rings at wheels, but I had changed the plans and we ordered two white meat meals to go at the Chicken King drive through box. I thought all of this might go down easier sitting on my truck tailgate where some things that were going to be talked about could be seen at the same time. Jill said he didn't care what we ate or where. As long as I was buying, he would eat anything and he would like it. If there were any hostilities still abiding over my trying to pull one over him earlier, he was keeping it stowed securely away. He just seemed like good old Jill to me. I pulled over off the road and eased my truck across the very shallow ditch in the process. W.T. Kimbro owned all the property to the north side of where our house sat on a two-acre lot. He used to grow cows, and now he stuck mainly to hay and straw. W.T. was an awfully nice man. He and his wife had always been excellent neighbors. They had never had any children, so Lissy ended up being their surrogate granddaughter. For a long time, they had a pony, and Lissy would walk over to their house just to feed and curry it. And sometimes she would ride it, but mainly she just petted it. The Kimbros also had a nicely maintained farm pond. During the warm months, if you wanted an audience with Lissy, your best shot at finding her would be looking at the pond. She truly did love going there to swim. So I stopped the truck and switched the engine off, and we sat there in silence as the motor did its ticking thing as it began to cool down. Without a word, I grabbed the food bag and stepped out of the truck. Jill brought the cups full of iced tea. We sat down after I clenched the bag with my teeth and let the tailgate down. The sun was just beginning to set and the pond that Lizzie used to adore so much looked like it was filled with molten gold. The clouds were twenty different shades of pink and purple as the sun began to fall behind them, and there was a dirt farm road that led from the pond back up to the main road. And if you turned left at the hard road, then it wasn't much more than a fifteen-minute walk to our house. A couple of lightning bugs were starting to appear here and there, and a crow passed silently overhead. Well, this is beautiful and romantic, and the chicken is swell, but I'm still not putting out, Jill said. I'm a happily married man. I just wanted you to know right off. Well, I was still staring at the ground, but I still grinned. Back in June, almost three months ago now, right up there by those oaks was where it happened. I said. Jill wiped his mouth and set his foot to the side. He knew exactly what I was referring to. He didn't say anything. He just stopped eating so he could listen to me more intently. It had been during the first week of the summer break from school. Lizzie and a couple of her friends had come down here and spent most of the day swimming and tanning. 
They had WT's permission, of course. Up around supper time, the friends decided to leave. They tried to talk Lizzie into letting them give her a ride home, but she said she'd rather stay a few more minutes, even if it meant that she would have to walk home. They didn't like leaving her, but they had to get going. Lizzie finally decided that if she didn't get home, Becky was going to tear her a new one. No school tomorrow or not. I have to say this here. Lissy cares or cared the least about catching the boy's eyes of any 15-year-old girl I'd ever heard about. She just doesn't care. That is why I threatened her within an inch of her life about walking all the way home in just her bathing suit. She just doesn't or didn't ever think about things like that. So she finally dragged herself out of the water about this time of the evening put a pair of jean shorts on over her bathing suit bottom, and she started walking home. Now, do you see how visible all this property is from the main road? Anyone driving could have seen her walking up that dirt road as long as there was light to see by. That's what happened that night, Jill. Lizzie was walking, and that Hawkins boy drove by her and saw her. She noticed the car go by, It was slowing as it drove. When it had gone past those trees and couldn't be seen any longer, it turned around and it came back. Only this time, it turned down the dirt road that she was walking on. She didn't know Hawkins. None of us did. He stopped and asked her if he could give her a ride since it would be dark soon, but she refused just like I taught her to do. Well, he kept after her to get in, and she kept saying no. Lizzie has outgrown a lot of shoes, but she's never worn a pair out. She goes barefoot most everywhere she goes. The bottoms of her feet are like leather, so it didn't bother her a bit to take off running. She was screaming as she ran, so whoever was bothering her might get scared and leave. Becky taught her to do that. Except that Hawkins was so stupid or too evil to get scared, he came after her and he caught her. She was screaming and wailing on him as he was carrying her back to his car. But way out here on a night like tonight, who's going to hear her? Jill started to say something, but I stopped him. Someone did hear her, and it's the only reason why I still have my little girl at home. I didn't eat anything. I felt like I was going to throw up if I tried swallowing any of that greasy chicken. But I drank a half a cup of my iced tea. I could feel the cotton mouth coming with every word. Becky and I don't even talk about this part. We both know it, but we don't talk about it. Hawkins was trying to drive up that road. The windows were down because of the heat, so she was trying to climb out any way she could. He was driving with one hand and pulling on her with the other. Lizzie was screaming and slapping and scratching him. The car was weaving all over the place because the tracks were still there a few days later for me to see. He was looking at the road on occasion and watching her the rest of the time. But when he did happen to look up once, he was off the road out into the hayfield over near those oaks. And that was when they saw it. They both saw it from what I've been told. Lizzie said that something similar to a gorilla, but walking upright like a man, was running out in those trees toward him. Must have really scared Hawkins because he forgot all about Lizzie and floored the car. He swerved to keep from hitting whatever had run out of the trees and lost control of the car. She said it spun around maybe three times and it only stopped when the hood and the engine wrapped themselves around one of those trees. Lizzie said she didn't remember how she ended up in the back seat, but that was where she was when she saw the flames start flaring up from the front of the car. She said that she tried climbing back over the seat to see if she could get out through the window, but her leg hurt so bad when she moved that she just tried to be still after that. She was still screaming, but she wasn't moving, and Hawkins kept begging for someone to come help. He was all twisted up against his door with the steering wheel pinning him down. 
His head was outside of the window, but everything else was trapped inside. She said she could feel it getting hotter by the minute. Her leg being broken in two places wasn't worrying her. Being burned alive in the back seat of the stranger's car was what was worrying her. She said she was screaming like she had never screamed before. That was when she said she heard a large boom and the car jumped a little. She started seeing flames coming from the rear of the car then as well. The back window exploded inward and she figured it was because of the heat. When she felt herself being pulled from the back seat by her hair, she tried to get away from whatever that was too, broken leg or not, but she just kept being pulled. She said there was a hole in the back window a little larger than a basketball and that was what she was being pulled through. She felt every cut as her skin grazed along the glass as she slid through it. She felt each and every slice to the sides of her face as she was pulled through that small hole in the glass. She felt the blood on her arms and her ribs and then her legs. She felt the heat from the car more as she got further from the back seat, but closer to the flames. She tried to jump and flinch as her bare skin slid across the hot metal, but she was held fast by the same thing that had pulled her out of the car. She said she knew that she was almost completely out of the car and was expecting to fall to the ground at any time but gigantic and strong hair-covered arms picked her up off that burning truck and held her securely and still. While Hawkins was still begging for help, and this thing that was carrying Lissy walked around and stared at the young man who was trapped, and just before she passed out, she saw a huge hairy hand reach out and grasp the boy by the head and twist it violently. He stopped begging, and she fell into unconsciousness. I drank the last drop from my cup, and I wanted more. Jill must have realized this because he handed me his cup. He didn't say anything as I drank a good bit of his before stopping. It had been a long while since I had forced myself to live through that part of the story, and it had been harder than I thought it would be. Imagining my little girl scared and hurt and screaming, I didn't ever want to think about that part ever again. I looked over out of the corner of my eye and I saw Jill studying the stand of oaks. He had known of Lissy being involved in an accident having to do with an automobile, but he had never known whose car or where the accident had taken place. Well, now he knew, and he was looking at the scene and replaying all of that that I had told him in his head, probably trying to imagine what had charged out of the woods and had rescued my daughter. I hadn't told him what little I knew of the thing yet, so there was no telling what image he had conjured up in his mind. It was Tuesday when all this happened, I told him, and that meant we were going down to Vinny's for the all-you-can-eat spaghetti supper. I was sitting in the den. Both Becky and myself were sitting there watching the news and waiting on Lizzie to come home so she could get changed. Going to Vinny's on Tuesdays was her call. She can eat her weight in Italian food. Becky kept looking at the clock, and I kept reminding her that Lizzie coming out of the water voluntarily wasn't something that she could put a timer on. And then we heard the roar. It sounded sort of like the bugle of a bull elk. You know how they sound from all those recordings they play on the outdoor channels? Sounded similar to that, only not as high-pitched and not as sustained either. I guess my example of how it sounded wasn't a very good one, was it? I don't suppose I can actually tell you what it sounded like. I'd never heard anything like it before. Well, I told Becky to stay where she was seated while I went to take a look. Now, I opened the back door just as that thing was walking across the yard toward a row of trees that serves as a boundary of my property line. Alyssi was laying in the grass just a few steps from the door. At the time, I didn't think I had ever seen so much blood. 
There wasn't all that much, really, but when it's your daughter that you're looking at, it all seems worse than it really is, I guess. She was as still as a rock, and I thought that she had passed on. And I jerked her up into my arms about the time that Becky made it to the door, and she started screaming and crying, but I got her calmed down quickly enough when I told her that Lizzie was still alive. Becky went to call the hospital to tell them that we were coming in on the double while I carried Lizzie around the front later in the back seat of Becky's car. While Becky was locking the door, I took one more look toward the trees and saw just a glimpse of that thing before it disappeared into the dark. I know now that he was watching to make sure that Lizzie was being taken care of. I didn't know that at the time but I was sure that whatever that thing was had been the one to hurt my daughter. You know most everything else that happened that night because you and Jen were sitting with us at the hospital. You remember how tuned up I was until I knew that she was going to be all right. Well, the surgery went fine to set her leg properly and the cuts to the sides of her face were bad, but they could have been worse. That's why she won't go anywhere now. When you're 15 years old and there are scars on both sides of your face, well, I can understand why she feels the way she does. Her plastic surgeon says that in time they'll look better, and once most of the swelling and color has faded from those cuts, he'll be able to do some work to make a large percentage of the damage disappear. Well, I think that's wonderful, but Lissy wants everything fixed right now, and I don't blame her. The whole time I was sitting in that hospital with Becky and the two of you, all I could think of was how I was going to find that thing and I was going to kill it. I wanted its big hairy head mounted over my workbench so I could go out there every day and know that I had killed it for what it had done to my little girl. But I sat there until Lissy came out of surgery and then Becky and I sat by her bed until she woke up. The police had come around a couple of times and I told them not to even think about coming back until Lissy said that she felt like talking. I told them that I would call them when she said that she would tell what happened. The next afternoon she did talk to them, but she didn't tell them the story that she told her mother and me. I was the one who advised her to do that. She was going to have enough rough days ahead of her without her inviting a circus down around her. She told the police that she didn't know the young man who had grabbed her and forced her into his car and had never seen him before. She said she fought and scratched and clawed at him trying to get away enough so that he finally lost control of the car and ran it into that tree. She was thrown into the back seat and was perfectly fine with waiting for help to come, but then she started seeing the flames from where the car had caught fire. She said that there were several cracks in the back glass and she punched at them until she knocked out a hole to wiggle through. She said it took everything she had to make it out to the backyard and hopping on one leg and laying down and dragging herself along that she didn't remember anything else until she woke up in the hospital. Now that was the story that she told the police. They asked her a lot of questions and then they told her to feel better and they were fair sure that they wouldn't need to bother her about all this anymore, but they were always going to be available if she needed them for anything at any time. That was the story she told him, but it wasn't the story she told Becky and me. She told us the truth. Well, I'm guessing that you brought me out here to tell me the truth. Am I right? Jill asked. I brought you out here to tell you the truth and to ask for your help, I said. Lizzie told us that thing actually ran at the car and that is why the boy drove into the tree. He saw it and got scared and crashed. She believes that this thing heard her screaming and came to help her. It might not have had that on its mind originally. Maybe it just came out of curiosity. But it being there is what caused that boy to wreck the car. After it wrapped around that tree, that thing came over and knocked a hole in the back glass so it could pull Lissy out. And then it went around and broke the neck of that boy that had taken her. 
I think that thing has been living around here for years because it knew where Lissy lived. It knew right where to take her. She didn't direct it anywhere. She was blacked out. That thing brought her home and laid her on the grass and then hollered and bellowed to get my attention. And then it ran off. And I saw it. And it was from a distance and nearly dark, but I did see it. And it was tall. I mean tall, like seven, maybe eight feet tall. And covered over with the stringy hair. And then it disappeared, but I saw something for a second before I gave all my attention to getting Lizzie to the hospital. It didn't walk right. It walked with some sort of limp or a tilt. Maybe it had been born deformed, I don't know. I only watched it for a second or two, and it was a ways off in bad light, but I know what I saw. Well, after I knew that Lizzie was going to be all right, I spent every minute that I could looking around in the woods around W.T.'s place. I was there for whatever Lizzie needed, and I was even there when she didn't want me to be there. But I spent a fair amount of time looking for this thing. Were you wanting to shake its hand and say thank you? Jill asked. I'm being serious. I just needed to see it. I knew what I knew, but I had to prove it to myself. I'd be the first to admit that on the evening that Lizzie got hurt, I wasn't thinking the clearest, but I didn't think I imagined something like what I thought I saw, especially after Lizzie told me everything that really happened. Every day for nearly a week, I would find two or three hours to go looking for this thing, and then one evening, I found it. I sat real still from 80 yards away, and I just watched it. Sometimes it would just sit there and stare up into the trees, and sometimes it would doze off. But then I watched it get up off the ground, and I knew that I had been right. It made pained expressions on that ugly, ape-looking face as it tried to stand. It didn't make any noises, but you could see that thing was hurting. I crawled out of there backwards so I could keep an eye on it, and then I ran as soon as I was back in open ground. I told Becky all about it, and maybe one day I'll tell Lissy, but, but not for a while, I won't. As soon as her leg is healed, she'd be out there looking for that thing, too. She might go looking anyway, knowing Lissy, Jill said. You're probably right about that, but Becky and me decided to keep what I knew a secret from her now. She still doesn't know that I went looking for it and found it. Late at night, Becky and me would talk about it some and how I wanted to do something that would help that thing since it had helped us. Becky suggested helping it out with food. She figured that if it was in pain while it walked, then going out looking for something to eat had to be hard on it. Just like the good southern woman she is, when someone is in trouble, the first thing they think of is getting food to them. Well, I didn't even know what this thing was, and I still don't, so there was no way I could know what it ate. But Becky said that I should take it some vegetables and then go check the spot a week later, and the stuff would either have been eaten or it'd be rotten in a pile that I had left there. Seemed like a logical plan to me, so I went to Robbie's two days later and just about bought him out. That thing is big, so I figured it'd take a fair amount to fill it up. I used an old tractor road of WTs, and I drove as far as I thought was safe. I didn't want to just go walking into where I had seen it sleeping, and I couldn't have carried all that produce that far back anyway. Well, I dumped everything out, and I split as quickly as I could, and I waited until the next Friday before I went back to look. Now, Jill, there wasn't a leaf of cabbage or a half-eaten tomato left. The place where I dumped everything was as clean as a pen. So the next day, after I went to the library, I went back to Robbie's and I loaded up again. Now I've been doing that every Saturday since I found it. Now that's the truth about all that stuff you saw in my truck earlier today. But now you know why I was hesitant about telling you the truth. I didn't want my best friend thinking I had lost my marbles. And I'm guessing that because you're a smart guy and all, you've already figured out what it is I want to ask you. Because I'm a veterinarian, you want me to go with you to watch this thing, 
to see if there's anything that can be done to help with its pain. Am I right? He asked. I always knew that Jen married you for your brains. If it had been looks that she was after, she would have been chasing me, I said. So you want me to go slinking around in the woods to give a diagnostic opinion from 80 yards away about an 8 foot tall ape like creature that has a limp? He asked. And not tell a soul about it afterwards, I said. Will the day after tomorrow be soon enough to suit you? He asked. I gave him the rest of his drink back and then I sat there silently as the sun finished setting. Just like clockwork, Jill pulled into my driveway at the time that he said he would be there. He had binoculars around his neck and a bag with a long adjustable strap hanging from one shoulder. I asked him if he thought we were going on safari. He said if we did happen to see something, then he wanted to be able to gather as much information as possible. That was the reason for the binoculars. The bag contained some different medicines and some needles, plus a small surgical kit. He told me that he held zero expectations of using anything from the bag, but if the opportunity did present itself and if there actually was something he could do, it would be better to have a few things handy right then, because there might not be another chance. He dumped everything on the seat of my truck through the open window and followed me inside. I needed to get my keys and he wanted to speak to Becky. He thought it might make her feel better if she saw that someone really was in the know along with her husband and was there to help out. She gave him a quick hug in the kitchen while I pulled my keys off the rack we had hanging by the door. I know I was surprised and I think all of us were when Lizzie came walking into the room. She's using a walker these days instead of crutches and the ease at which she could be mobile had started helping her outlook. But slowly, feeling better about things or not, none of us expected to see her come out of the room when a visitor was in the house. Jill didn't say anything as he nearly ran across the room and wrapped her in the biggest, tightest hug you ever saw. She flinched when he started for her, but she didn't say anything. He kept stroking the back of her head as he held her, and she kept patting him on the back, telling him that everything was going to be okay. She even called him Uncle Jill like she used to when she was younger. We talked for just a minute after he had let go of her, and then we left. We sat down in my truck, and when I started to turn the key, Jill reached over and put his hand on top of mine. Whatever I can do to help you or your family... All you have to do is say so. I know you know that, but I'm just reminding you, he said. Don't you ever forget that. I cranked the truck and pulled out of the driveway before he could say anything else. I led the way and Jill followed closely behind, looking at every tree and rock that we passed. He was a vet, and a good one from what I've been told, but he mainly sticks to dogs and cats and the occasional bird. Jill is not a woodsy type of guy. He has a partner in his practice who does all the horse and cow and pig visits. The great outdoors had never seemed so great to Jill, but he was being quiet and watching his step so he wouldn't fall down and make a racket. We walked for 45 minutes. It usually took me 20 if I was alone, but for as hard as he was trying to do as I was doing and not make any mistakes, His being there was definitely slowing things down. We were nearing where I had seen the thing taking its ease two or three times, so we dropped down to all fours and we crawled a little piece. Jill stayed quiet and didn't ask not even the first question while I watched everywhere for a sign of that thing. I had about decided that the trip down there was a bust and that we weren't going to see it, That was a disappointment, to say the least. Yes, I wanted Jill to see if there was anything he could do to help, but mainly I wanted Jill to see it so that I wouldn't be the only one. Aside from Lizzie, I was the only one, and I wasn't going to mention anything about anything to her about that day. 
If she wanted to talk about something, I was going to let her be the one to bring it up. Someday, maybe I could go back to being a regular father, but for a while, my main concern was making her life as calm and as comfortable as I possibly could. It stepped into the small clearing where I had seen it sitting that first time, and Jill nearly fainted dead away. He leaned over and just about put his mouth against my ear so that he could whisper lowly and still be heard. I knew that you had seen something, but truthfully, I was humoring you because you're a friend and you've been through quite an ordeal. I never dreamed you might actually be telling the truth. I was ready to say, oh well, we'll find it the next time when nothing ever showed up. Now I can't believe what I'm seeing, he said. I told him that we could talk later. For now, he needed to watch that thing and tell me if there's any way that it could be helped. He squirmed around and planted his elbows in the leaves so he could study it through those fancy binoculars. He had bought them for taking to football games. I know this because I was with him. I bet he never imagined using them for what he was looking at now. It came lumbering into plain sight, and he looked just like I had described him to Jill. When fully erect, it had to go north of eight feet, and it must have weighed six or seven hundred pounds. Covered with matted, rust-colored hair over most of its body, with a few splotches of graying here and there, I watched Jill watching it, and I saw Jill's brow wrinkle into knots above his binoculars, the awestruck voyeur was gone, and for the moment, only the concerned veterinarian was beside me. He was doing just what he had thought was idiotic and impossible. He was making a diagnosis from a very long ways away from the patient, and he didn't seem at all happy with what he was seeing. We watched as the thing tried several different angles before it finally just stretched out its long arms to break its fall when it just dropped to the ground. It sat very still for a moment, I guess until the pain subsided, and then it shifted gradually until it found a position to sit in that was more or less comfortable. Jill allowed the binoculars to rest on the leaves and simply stared at the thing. The look he had on his face told me why he was considered such a good and caring vet. What he was seeing was troubling him. I think that, by and large, vets are more troubled by pain and suffering in their patients than doctors are with theirs. Not that doctors don't care, because they do, and an awful lot. The last three months with Lizzie had proved that to me, but animals can't tell you where it hurts or how badly. And the vets have to feel that somehow. That was what Jill was doing at the moment. We need to back off so we can talk, he said to me. We crawled for a while and then stood up and walked for quite a distance. We did all of this in silence. I could never be positive without running a few simple tests, which is probably out of the question. But if I had to guess, I'd say there had been some serious damage to its hip in the past. It going without proper treatment left the injury to heal as best it could on its own. I'm almost sure that there has been a fairly advanced case of some sort of arthritis taken hold, and it's calling the shots now for your friend, he said. Isn't there anything we can do? I asked. Sure there is. You bring him down to my clinic after you've made an appointment, of course, and I'll set up for extensive x-rays. And then we'll follow by surgery, which I'm almost certain will be necessary, and then we'll get the big fella on a course of pain medication and some rehab motions that'll help it get over the surgery and improve the movement it has in that hip, he said. So nothing can be done is what you're trying to say to me, I said. No, there isn't. The injury and the aftermath, it's only going to get worse. I could see that it's having some difficulty in breathing as well. I think that the best that you can hope for is that it dies before the cold weather sets in. And just going by what I saw, I think that's likely to happen. 
Now you keep bringing it the food like you have been, and that will help it keep some calories going in. I don't know where you're putting the food, but if you can put it somewhere even closer so that it doesn't have to travel as much, I think that would be a help also. I believe it to be in significant pain, and the less walking, the better, he said. We walked on and were almost back to the truck before he spoke to me again. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I want to ask you, and if it were anyone else and under different circumstances, I might ask for the body when it finally dies. To study such a thing would be incredible, and to publish a paper based on my findings would make me one of the most well-known vets in this country, if not the world. But I know why that thing is special to you, so I won't ever ask you about it again. If you want to talk about that thing, I'll listen, but I won't bring up the subject again, he said. Well, I thanked him for the words and for everything as he got back in his truck. Are you going to talk about it with Lissy, he asked. Maybe someday, if she wants to talk about it, I will. If she wants to try to forget as much of this mess as she can, I'm fine with that, too. But you're a lucky man to have had the time to watch that thing as closely as you have. A lot of folks don't even believe that they're real, or at least still exist. And here you are feeding one. That's a big deal, buddy, said Jill. I know I'm lucky. I know it every time I walk into the house and I see my daughter. What little I've done for that thing is the very least I can do for it. I'll never be able to repay the debt I owe it, I said as I turned the truck toward the main road.